peux rien faire, je peux même pas lire une recette, je peux pas, je peux plus manger. Je... Bonjour à tous, je suis Satis Kouvelakis et j'ai le plaisir de recevoir à hors série Andreas Malm. Euh, Andreas Malm est professeur d'écologie humaine à l'université de Lund en Suède et c'est l'un des auteurs, on peut dire aujourd'hui, de référence pour euh, tout ce qui concerne le champ de l'écologie politique d'un point de vue radical, d'un point de vue anticapitaliste. Euh, il a publié plusieurs ouvrages, initialement en langue anglaise, euh, dont un nombre important sont traduits en français. Euh, je les énumère euh, rapidement. Son premier livre, qui est un livre majeur issu de sa thèse, est « Fossil Capital », Capital fossile, qui n'a pas été traduit en tant que tel en français, mais dont on peut avoir un aperçu substantiel dans le recueil d'essais publié par La Fabrique en 2017, l'Anthropocène contre l'Histoire. Et puis, dernièrement, deux ouvrages, euh, La chauve-souris et le capital, qui sera au centre de notre discussion d'aujourd'hui, et Fascisme fossile, l'extrême droite, l'énergie, le climat, qui sera l'objet d'une prochaine discussion également sur hors-série. So, Andreas, a pleasure to have you. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Here, yeah, yeah, many thanks. Um, so, uh, I think that um, we need to situate the specificity of your approach of questions that are now, that have now become absolutely central in the public uh, debate and uh, themes and topics about which I think everyone has read an awful lot. Uh, and I think that to uh, be direct, what is specific about your approach of those much debated topics such as climate change in general, the ecological crisis, and more specifically the COVID crisis, is that you show in a very detailed and precise way that what is at stake in all that is capitalism not, generally speaking, the action of human beings considered in a, a historical and general way, uh, not uh, the pseudo-concept of Anthropocene that you deconstruct uh, very thoroughly, uh, but a very specific mode of production that appeared in its uh, current form about two centuries ago um, in Europe and uh, in the Western world. Um, of course, the idea that capitalism is somehow behind uh, the ecological crisis is uh, not uh, something that is new in itself. And uh, there is a whole school, actually, of radical socialist and Marxist thinking making this point. Uh, your specific, I think, contribution to that is the concept of uh, fossil capital uh, at the center of your first book. And uh, what you show there historically is that uh, capitalist development faced a kind of historical bifurcation towards the third decade of the 19th century. Uh, it moved from, uh, for reasons that are not self-evident, from a form of energy, water power, to another, steam power. And you show very precisely that uh, this change cannot be explained by standard economic thinking. It's not a matter of cost-benefit analysis. It cannot be explained by sheer technological determinism. There is a quantitative element there that uh, needs to be analyzed. Uh, and uh, what is exactly this quantitative element that explains this kind of intimate connection between capitalism and fossil capital. Why are these two things, according to you, so much embedded in each other? Well, yeah, at, at that specific moment in time, when that bifurcation happened, the advantages of steam power were uh, several. Uh, one very great advantage was that a steam engine could be located essentially anywhere this was before uh, electrical transmission, so if you had a water wheel to power a factory, you had to place the water wheel in the river, and you had to have the factory directly adjacent to the, to the river. And this meant that even though water was a cheaper source of energy, you were bound to certain localities in space, 
often uh, streams in the countryside where the water was abundant and, and cheap, but where perhaps there were very few workers and those that existed might not be resigned to factory discipline. So uh, it was advantageous for manufacturers to uh, be able to locate in cities. And that you could do with a steam engine. You could just put it up anywhere and, and transport the coal to burn uh, under the boiler of the steam engine. Another great advantage was the independence from the weather cycle uh, of the steam engine. Uh, water wheels could uh, slow down if there wasn't enough water flowing in the river because of dry weather. Or they could uh, come to a stop if the rivers froze during the winter. This was primarily in northern England and Scotland. Um, but a steam engine was entirely in the hands of the master in time. You could just switch it on and off as you liked. And you could also increase the speed of the steam engine by burning more coal. To increase the heat in the boiler and the piston would move faster. There was no way to push a button to make the water wheel run faster. So it, the steam engine was independent uh, in space and time to an extent that the water wheel was not. And this was fundamentally because of the fossil fuel that powered the this, this steam engine, namely coal, that you took from under the ground and that as a source of energy did not have any uh, relation or was not integrated into the landscape or uh, the temporal cycles of the weather in, in the present. So fossil fuels allowed capital to kind of produce its own spaces and time at times, and, and maximize profit, locate production where there were supplies of cheap and disciplined labor power, and accelerate production when needed by, by the help of machines. Uh, that was the, the, the close link that I found in my, in my empirical research on why the shift happened mm -hmm. from water to steam in the British mm -hmm. uh, cotton industry. Today, the links are different mm -hmm. uh, and, and look very different from at that point in time. But, yeah. Right. So, but if I understand you correctly, from that kind of founding moment, let's yeah. say, onwards, we have a kind of path-oriented development that links um, quantitatively capitalism to fossil fuel. And, and then, you know, when oil took over, there was a kind of repetition of that uh, mm. Uh, of that impulse? Is, it, is, is that, is that yeah, the yeah, way yeah. I mean, if, if we If we classically define capital as self-expanding value, so a, a process of generating more exchange value, you know, make profit and reinvest the profit to generate even further profit and mm -hmm. onwards, mm -hmm. fossil capital would be that process but passing through the production and combustion of fossil fuel. So therefore you have a a trend of self-sustaining growth that also produces uh, a growth in CO2 emissions. And this is what we've had for two centuries. And it's, it goes on. It will happen this year as well. There will be, after last mm -hmm. year's mm -hmm. dip, there will apparently be a massive mm -hmm. rebound to mm -hmm. something like business as usual, mm -hmm. where you again have a growth in, mm -hmm. in emissions. Mm -hmm. We, we'll come back to the, the point I want to raise just now, but very briefly, yeah. I mean, at that stage. Um, what would be your, your answer to the question, is a non-fossil capital possible? Is, is, is a capitalism not based on fossil capital possible? Not, not necessarily a genuinely green capitalism, yeah, but at yeah. least one that is not based on fossil fuels. Yeah, yeah so we had a non-fossil capitalism originally. Before, originally, yeah. yes. Before the transition. Now that ran into certain contradictions at a particular stage in its development. But uh, axiomatically, I don't think that we can say that we know for a certainty that capitalism absolutely presupposes fossil fuels. I mean, capitalism mm -hmm. is an incredibly versatile, protein adaptable mode of production. And I, I think, I mean, I can't rule out a scenario where we mm -hmm. totally get rid of fossil fuels, but also have some kind of capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I can't say that I know for a certainty that logically the end of fossil fuels means the end of the capitalist mode of production. What I, what I can say that I know, I think quite, with, with quite a degree of certainty and confidence, is that the end of fossil fuels means the end of a very important and powerful segment of the capitalist class, if you will, namely 
the mm. fraction of the class that profits mm. from the production of fossil fuels. Mm. We mm. can't have mm. Total, BP, Shell, ExxonMobil, mm. Saudi Aramco, mm. all of these uh, uh, mm. capitalist corporations that generate their profit from the production of fossil fuels. Mm. And uh, uh, transcending, well, ending that section, that, that part of the capitalist class, uh, might not necessarily logically mean that you have to abolish capitalism as a whole, but it certainly means a process of transcending uh, present capitalism mm -hmm. and who knows where it will end up. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so let's move now from the mode of production to something that is more specific and yeah. to the current uh, conjuncture, which is <laughs> decisively shaped by uh, the COVID crisis. Um, so once again, I mean, this has been, I mean, since, you know, a year and a half, I mean, we have barely been discussing about uh, anything uh, else yeah. than, than this uh, COVID crisis. Yeah. And uh, your, the, the starting point, actually, uh, of, of your own uh, demonstration here is a concept that um, uh, has been developed by scientists and, and, and researchers already. It's uh, the zoonotic spillover, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that concerning this uh, specific pandemic, uh, the origins are located in uh, the fact that the virus was in an animal, uh, more likely the bat here yeah. appears as being the protagonist of this, uh, yeah. of this story, hence the French title actually, which is yeah. slightly different from the English, it's uh, uh, the bat and, uh, the, and, and the capital. Yeah. Um, and uh, from the bat it moved to uh, human beings because there is an increasing interaction and overlap of territories between mm. animals in general mm. and wildlife mm. more, uh, uh, more generally and uh, the terrain of human action and more specifically economic activities. Mm. And then it spreads instantly because of the modern means mm. of communication and so on. Mm. So the, the, this part, you know, this is I think now quite you know, widely known. What you show is that behind all this, we have very specific mechanisms of uh, the current phase of capitalist accumulation, mm. which are extractivism and uh, deforestation, uh, leading to what you call, and I, find, I found this concept extremely interesting and fruitful, uh, ecologically unequal exchange. Mm. Um, can you uh, elaborate a bit on uh, why is specifically capitalism at stake here? Or to put it differently, why we shouldn't consider the COVID crisis as something external mm. to capitalism itself? Huh? Because this is a quite widely spread view that, you know, the 2008 crisis was clearly yeah. a crisis of financial capitalism, the banks collapsed. Okay, so it's, it's quite obvious that it has to do with capitalism. Here we have a virus, so... Mm seemingly something coming from, you know, outside, mm. from, from an external mm. trend. You say, no, there is something specific, specifically capitalist at the root of this crisis. Mm. So why, why is that so? Yeah, so just as to say, there, the, this particular coronavirus that we've suffered from, what is it now, 18 months, a year and a half? Yeah, the, it's just the latest one in a whole series of emerging infectious diseases that have jumped from wildlife populations into humanity. And this trend, it almost tracks the trend in the rise in, in the in concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere or the rising temperature. This trend is fundamentally driven by processes in the economy. Uh, and the, the central one is deforestation in the tropics. Because uh, in, uh, in tropical forests, there is an abundance of uh, biodiversity of all kinds, including of pathogens that circulate naturally in those forests. And when those forests are cut down or intersected with roads or opened for extraction, for mines, for pipelines, uh, th there are interfaces established, so points of contact between uh, the human economy, if you like, and those populations of pathogens. And that's when the jumps can happen. And that's why we see more of those jumps, because the wild wildlife is not uh, left in peace. To the contrary, you have constant incursions into and destruction of those habitats, and the, the, the pathogens come flying in the face of the, of the humans that uh, are at the front line. And... Uh, 
Uh, what happened in China with a spillover of a, a coronavirus from a, a population of bats that served as the natural reservoir host for this virus, and then probably uh, via some intermediary hosts such as pangolins or something like that, and then to humans, was just one instantiation of this, of this trend, of this uh, process. <coughs> and um, uh, deforestation is, is a part of uh, the, the uh, situation in China as well, where you have chaos in, in bat populations because forests have been torn down. Uh, and uh, uh, deforestation in the tropics is very concretely tied to supply chains that cross continents, uh, where companies um, import commodities from the tropics, uh, where those commodities are produced on what used to be rainforest land very often. So, for instance, uh, palm oil, which is massively imported into the European Union, for instance, very often comes from Malaysia and other countries in Southeast Asia, where tropical rainforests have been torn down and replaced with palm oil plantations. Uh, this is the ecologically unequal exchange aspect of it, where you have a massive import of, uh, of ecological space into the global north with those commodity flows. And uh, that's, of course, part of, of, a, of a very distinctly capitalist process. On a more abstract le level, I think you can argue that capital cannot tolerate the idea that you have wild nature um, uh, existing for its own sake mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. of uh, uh, f commodity relations and exchange value. It's a kind mm -hmm. of uh, uh, anathema uh, to the whole logic of capitalism, which is that if you have biophysical resources, you should subsume them under the imperative of exchange value mm -hmm. and turn mm -hmm. them into sources mm -hmm. of profit. Mm -hmm. And this has been constitutive of the logic of capitalism since its mm -hmm. origins, I would say. And mm -hmm. what we're seeing now is mm -hmm. just one result of it, namely that mm -hmm. uh, the, cap the capitalist economy constantly encroaches on what is left of the wild and transforms it into spaces for commodity mm -hmm. production mm -hmm. with very destructive consequences. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you show also that uh, concerning deforestation more specifically, uh, it has been happening since you know a very long time, yeah. but it was essentially driven by states up to a certain point. Yeah. And from the 1970s yeah. about onwards, it's essentially private companies yeah. now that yeah. are driving the process, which means that it's the move towards a new stage of capitalism actually yeah. uh, that explains the current form probably of deforestation and the fact that it has become even more extensive and intensive than, mm -hmm. than it used to be. And um, the, the question I wanted to ask you is, uh, when, when reading your text actually, I was thinking of uh, David Harvey's concept of um, accumulation by dispossession mm -hmm. as being one characteristic of the new imperialism or the new form that imperialism is taking at uh, the stage of let's say, neoliberal capitalism. Uh, is, is, it, is it an analysis you would agree with? Um, is, is there a level of... Uh, because, Absolutely, yeah. yeah? yeah, yeah. Let, let me just say that uh, it, it's, it's interesting to probe perhaps a little bit deeper into the relation between the state and private actors in deforestation. Uh, last year in 2020, during the pandemic, deforestation in the tropics accelerated massively. You would imagine that there would be some kind of collective rationality <laughs> at work even from, from capitalist classes and from bourgeois institutions. I mean, you would imagine deep into the, this pandemic that something like World Economic Forum or the World Bank or the IMF or the G70 or G20 or something like that would, would phrase the question, how do we avoid that this happens again? How do we make sure that we, we uh, don't uh, suffer another economic crash like, like in 2020, a few years down the road? And how do we go after the causes of uh, this problem? But mm -hmm. there's nothing of that. Instead, what you saw last year mm -hmm. was that deforestation in the tropics reached its, its third highest level since comprehensive measures started in mm -hmm. 2002. Mm -hmm. 
but it was worse in Brazil. Yeah, yeah. because of Bolsonaro. Because of Bolsonaro. Yeah. And Bolsonaro is the president, so he's mm -hmm. in, in charge of the state apparatus. So, of course, the state is extremely important for how these things play out. Yeah. But what he does is that he's given a free reign yeah. to private actors to go in yeah. and destroy the Amazon and link up with global supply chains and hand over... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, swathes of yeah. the Amazon to producers of meat uh, or to producers of various types of uh, uh, yeah, goods that come from plantations. Yeah, and, yeah. Various kinds. and I think in the case of Bolsonaro, there, there is a clear element of class and race revenge, yes, right? Because yes. he dismantled the framework that Lula had yes, put in place exactly. to protect the communities yeah. of, 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 the, of the people yeah. and, of course, to protect nature yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and Bolsonaro wants to destroy mm. both. So exactly. I think that here we have a, a clear view. Uh, you know, what, what strikes me in, in your demonstration is that although some elements of, of this, of the ecologically unequal exchange, are known. Uh, they are usually presented in a way to make uh, the consumers of um, the economically more developed countries guilty mm -hmm. of that whole process. Mm -hmm. huh? Because mm -hmm. uh, as you show, deforestation is essentially driven by uh, the trade of full commodities, right? Mm -hmm. uh, palm oil, um, uh, wood products. Um, what are the other? What are the other two? Uh, livestock. Uh, yeah, livestock. Uh, so, Soy. so uh. a very limited number of commodities actually mm. are driving this whole process. Hence, you know, the, this whole encouragement of consumers. You know, don't buy products that mm. have uh, palm oil, mm. etc. But your analysis shows that if we don't change the whole mechanism mm. of uh, capitalist appropriation mm. of space, of land, mm. uh, and the organization of free trade. I think there is a dimension here, you know, what the free trade does uh, mm -hmm. to, this, to this whole process and how we should put perhaps, you know, ecological criteria to, you know, change somehow the rules mm. of, of trade uh, at, a, at a global scale. Uh, nothing can really change. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, it's extremely difficult for a consumer, even the most enlightened kind of consumer in the global mm. north mm. to know what resources have made it into the final commodity as inputs and to deselect them and go for a supposedly clean, pure product. I mean, I don't know if such products exist on our shelves. And the, the supply chains that feed into these products are not transparent. It's not like I, as an, as an individual, can stand in front of the shelves and see where uh, various components of the good I'm, I'm considering buying come from. That's, that's, the, that's the process of reification, that mm -hmm. you, don't, you're, you as an individual mm -hmm. consumer are not in control of mm -hmm. all of these flows. Mm -hmm. uh, but a, a state or a, some other kind of public institution could certainly open the books of companies and uh, use their incredible capacities for surveillance to have a look instead of uh, at individual citizens at these companies. I mean, researchers can break down those mm -hmm. supply chains mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and track the flows of goods. So of mm -hmm. course, states could do it as well and uh, potentially you know, make, make proper audits, inventories, and then try to, to control the supply chain so mm -hmm. that they don't wreak havoc mm -hmm. on tropical rainforests. Mm -hmm. That's not mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and it doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, a case that, that I've read a little bit on uh, in, the, in the past few days is the East African crude oil pipeline that Total is building. It will be the world's longest heated oil pipeline from Lake Albert uh, on the border between Congo and Uganda, through Uganda and Tanzania out to, to the coast to transport oil. And this uh, pipeline will run through 12 forest reserves that are incredibly important uh, habitats for wildlife in a very ecologically sensitive part of the world. It will pass 230 rivers. And of course, it will create new interfaces for zoonotic spillover because we know that there is an incredible abundance of pathogens residing precisely in those forests in Central Africa. And nonetheless, the Macron uh, uh, presidency is supporting wholeheartedly Total in this project. Mm -hmm. And how, uh, how, is, uh, how is an individual French consumer going to change that in any way?
whatsoever. It's not on the level of individual consumption that a project such as this creates new interfaces for Zoom or XPLO. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, just to nuance a bit what you, uh, we have just been saying, the two other products which I haven't mentioned are uh -huh. beef and soybean, which yeah. is very much linked actually to the uh, the, the, the beef industry, let's say, the yeah. production of, of beef. And at some point you seem to suggest that mandatory, I mean, you, be, you seem to be tempted by the idea of a, a mandatory um, turn to uh, veganism yeah. or, or yeah. banning of, not, not, not just of imports of, of, uh, of meat and, and yeah. beef, but more generally yeah. of banning uh, consumption of, yeah. of, of, of meat. Um, uh, don't you think there might be, I mean, I if you move these kind of things, you fall in the trap of moving things at, in the terrain of consumption and then in the very slippery terrain, I think, of lifestyle politics, yeah. a terrain in which the right, as we have seen, is, is, uh, might be very efficient, perhaps mm. even more than us, huh? mm -hmm. because it can, you know, bring... Um, uh, the confrontation into that terrain, you know, mm. as a kind of, you see, the, the ecologists, the Greens, they are, sure. uh, mm -hmm. you know, fundamentalists, they want to ban meat and you won't be able to eat meat. And, you know, meat, even in developed countries, mm. uh, for broad ranges of the population, has a cultural and symbolic mm. value, right? I mean, it, it, it might not be the case anymore, or much less so in relatively affluent, let's say, middle classes or, you know, very educated people, very sensitive to ecological issues. But, but for broader layer of, of populations, they, they don't think exactly the same way. So don't <laughs> no, you think, yeah, so don't, don't, don't you think that it might be a bit, uh, you know, sure. moving perhaps to a terrain where we, we should perhaps see things differently? Yeah, yeah the meat question is extremely sensitive, uh, for sure. Uh, and I should say that I'm not even a vegan myself. So I, I'm a vegetarian, but I'm not saying this because, uh, or I'm not, insofar as I'm advocating veganism, it's not of, out of any dietary preference because mm. I would very much like to keep my yogurt and my eggs and stuff like that. So I, I have respect for this kind mm. of, uh, you know, identification with what one eats. Uh, uh, and the, yeah, I, so I, I have a dalliance with the idea of, of mandatory global veganism in the book. And uh, of course, I don't want to impose any kind of ban on, say, Inuits not to eat meat or uncontacted tribes in the, in the Amazon to stop, eat, to stop hunting. Uh, of course not. Uh, and uh, generally imposing blanket bans on all kinds of meat consumption is probably not the, not, not the right way forward either. But certain kinds of meat, of trade with meat, mm -hmm. should discontinue. And mm -hmm. the most obvious one is stop every import of meat from the Amazon or from, from Brazil to Europe or other parts of the global north. Uh, I mean, there, there is reindeer and caribou and things like that that you can hunt in Sweden. And I wouldn't go out and stop. I mean, I have friends who do it. And uh, I, 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 I'm personally not attracted by the idea of hunting. But it's not like I would go out and try to, try to stop them from doing that. Yeah, so l lots of meat consumption can probably be justified. But I do think that it's very hard to uh, refute the case for a wide transition towards plant-based food as a necessary way to relinquish uh, space and hand it back mm -hmm. to forests mm -hmm. and to uh, uh, wilder processes in nature for lots of reasons, to stop the sixth mass extinction, mm -hmm. to, to slow down global warming. Um, and to avoid zoonotic spillover, to give more uh, space to, to uh, animal populations to migrate without uh, spilling, seeding their, their viruses onto humans. This kind of shift will need to happen primarily uh, in the affluent classes of the global north, mm -hmm. but also some of the affluent classes in the global south that have begun, as they become richer, to adopt lifestyles from the global north and eat more meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's true, it's true. However, in the global north, uh, meat consumption is ve follows very much class lines, yeah, right? Sure, yeah. It, it, yeah. Uh, right, L let's, let's go now to a point concerning the management of this mm. COVID crisis and the role of the state more mm. particularly. Uh, 
Uh, you make two points here. The first is that uh, what we have seen uh, happening, which seemed highly unlikely before mm. that, are extremely drastic measures taken by states in order to uh, confront, to address the pandemic, right? So uh, you even formulate things in terms of capitalism being uh, suspended, right, uh, as, as such, uh, or being paused overnight, right, because production was paused and consumption also for in, in, in certain sectors of the, uh, of the economy and a whole number of uh, social activities as well. Um, so this kind of state voluntarism is a precious lesson for us, mm. I mean, who want to change things. And we have seen that, you know, what was considered as impossible before mm. now has become possible, even trivial, you know. Um, we have seen, you know, spending, for instance, that was, you know, totally yeah. forbidden yeah. before because of the uh, austerity uh, and, and uh, neoliberal uh, uh, economic orthodoxy now has become, you know, spend, 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 you know, please, you know, otherwise, you know, everything will collapse. I mean, obviously, so it's, uh, so we know what, the state intervenes to save capitalism from itself, in a way, right? Um, however, this voluntarism is, 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 is a lesson that we should uh, keep in mind and um, draw some lessons from it. But your second point is that all this uh, frantic activity, actually, is essentially palliative. Mm. Uh, it treats the symptoms, mm. uh, not the cause. Mm. And uh, at some point, you even say that the agenda that the left has put forward during the crisis uh, is only half satisfactory. I mean, the agenda here being, you know, more spending on the health system, mm -hmm. um, you know, caring uh, better about uh, uh, the, those who are unemployed, uh, uh, stop austerity measures, uh, rebuild public services, you know, this, the, this whole agenda is necessary, but also unsatisfactory because it doesn't address the causes. And the causes are ev everything we have mentioned uh, before. Now, this was written in April, right, at, at the start of the, of, of the crisis. We are now a year and a half uh, nearly after that. And we have seen actually a great variety of ways to manage the crisis, right, at a, at a, at a world scale. Uh, we have seen denialists mm. of, of, of COVID. And uh, it's not a coincidence, of course, these people are also the climate change mm. denialists. Mm. Bolsonaro and Trump mm. are obvious mm. examples here. Mm. But even in Europe, actually, um, your own country, Sweden, mm. has followed a, quite a different mm. path from the rest of Scandinavia mm. and even mm. from countries like uh, France or Germany, much less uh, constraints, much mm. less measures, uh, extraordinary mm. measures, you know, much more of a kind of, you know, preserving uh, supposedly individual freedoms and mm. so on and so forth. But we have seen something appearing as a successful way to handle the crisis, or at least uh, this is how it is uh, presented uh, by countries in Southeast Asia. Mm. First and foremost, China. I mean, China mm. has got rid of, you know, where the COVID started, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. they got rid of it, you know, very quickly. Mm -hmm. But, and this is my point, actually, uh, imposing a very authoritarian framework, actually. Mm -hmm. And we have seen it, okay, in a somehow more diffuse uh, way, happening uh, in most countries, actually. I mean, the COVID crisis clearly has accelerated uh, a road already taken towards more authoritarian form of neoliberal policies. Um, this is something that is not really discussed in your, in, in your, in your book, actually. Mm. So how would you evaluate these two elements? I mean, how can we explain, first of all, you know, the, the, the diversity and even the divergence of uh, those um, crisis management models on the one hand? And secondly, do you think that um, there might be a kind of successful capitalist way uh, to address the COVID crisis, at least? Mm. Yeah, first of all, I, I have to acknowledge that I'm anything but an expert on how these various management models have played out. Mm. And as you said, I, yeah, I wrote that book at an early phase in the pandemic, over six weeks. And uh, I, once I, I had finished that book, I didn't follow these developments closer than, than the average citizen. Uh, 
uh, I've I've spent the pandemic first in Germany and then in Sweden. Uh, so I, I saw the contrast very the very stark contrast uh, initially. Then Sweden had to change trajectory and uh, become more like any other European country from November onwards last year. So the, the Swedish kind of laissez-faire model didn't work so well, apparently. Uh, but I, I'm not in a position, I don't, I don't have the knowledge to be able to do a comparative assessment mm -hmm. of what has worked uh, mm -hmm. and what not. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I think the jury is still out to some degree on this matter, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is clearly a capitalist way of managing uh, this, this crisis, both in the palliative terms and in uh, attempts to uh, supervise closer the uh, interfaces between humans and uh, wild animals that have pathogens uh, on their bodies. You know, there's talk about instituting various kinds of monitoring uh, f movement of animals and things like that, which obviously fits into the picture of authoritarian mm -hmm. neoliberalism, where the response to everything is mm -hmm. more surveillance mm -hmm. and more, uh, yeah. yeah and, and to monitor mobility of human beings themselves. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Hence, you know, this yeah. whole, I mean, the, the, the re-emergence of the Foucauldian uh, notion of biopolitics, biopolitics I mean yeah, which has yeah. become a, you know uh, I mean a, a topic I mean it has become a, uh, everyone uses the yeah, term I mean now it has become so do, do you think that this might be a, a capitalist way out of the COVID crisis well yeah it's not a way it, maybe it's a way out of this particular crisis with mm. a with a vaccine mm. rollout mm. in the global mm. north mm. it's mm. potentially mm. but that, that depends of course on mutations mm. and mm. things like that a way out of the crisis mm. for our mm. countries mm. with the emerging global vaccine apartheid mm. that means mm. leaving india and, other, and uh, mm. other parts of the global south in the lurch mm. uh, but it's I don't think that a securitization of the problem of zoonotic mm. spillover with more of monitoring will prevent it from happening mm. again if you just continue to raise mm. tropical rainforests and allow wildlife trading to continue mm. and, and keep the other drivers in motion, not mm. at least to mention global warming. There are just mm. fresh reports coming out mm. from bat populations uh, migrating very rapidly in Asia because of rising temperatures. And of course, mm. that, will, that will continue with global mm. warming and will send more bats flying mm -hmm. into uh, places where humans live mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. seed their pathogens on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think that we'll, we, we'll come back to this point because, um, you know, for, for socialists, for Marxists, um, there is always a tendency a bit to underestimate the adversary and yeah. to underestimate the fact that even if we accept that, you know, the temporality of climate change and ecological crisis mm. is not a gradual linear temporality. Mm. I mean, you insist very much on the fact that, you know, it's a process that has been accelerating. You use the term landslide, etc. Nevertheless, there, there are still different temporalities at stake mm. here. Mm. Uh, you, you have the temporality of the global ecological crisis on the one hand, and then you have, you know, more dis discrete or, or uh, conjunctural crises mm. like uh, the, the, the last one, the COVID one, which will certainly not be the, the, the last and, and capitalism, I think, or capitalist states at least, know how to play with mm. this gap of temporalities and, and sure. say, you see, we are still in control mm. of things and we have our own way mm. to address uh, mm. the issue. And, you know, we'll see about the rest and, mm. you know, we'll, uh, mm. I mean, uh, but, but, but for the moment we can overcome the kind of crisis of trust mm. on, on the ability of capitalist elites, right, mm. to control the processes and, and, and so on. So if we underestimate this and um, we just put forward a kind of apocalyptic vision of things that, you know, this is really the end of the world coming now, the risk of this is that um, if it doesn't materialize in a few months or in a year, you see, um, then uh, it might turn in the advantage of, of, of capital and of capitalist states, actually. Yeah, of course, we should uh, avoid unwarranted alarmism, but we sh I don't think we should uh, try to minimize the danger that is uh, not only coming towards us, but, but already here. But, I mean, uh, 
in a sense, the, the, these, these apocalyptic processes, to use that term, are very uneven. So mm. if they're already playing out on uh, f quite a few places around the world. There is a horrible drought in Madagascar right now. Mm -hmm. Parts of central Iraq have turned into a dust bowl because the rain hasn't appeared in, in years. Last year, 30 million people were displaced by uh, extreme weather events, far more than were displaced by armed conflict in the world, and this is just rising and rising and rising all the time. But these disasters are primarily, of course, unfolding uh, in the global south if, and hitting uh, poor and working people uh, in, in Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Asia. Uh, so it's, it's far from us, it, it, it would appear, until all of a sudden there is an extreme heat wave in France or, or wildfires in the, in the Pacific uh, US or something like that. Uh, yeah. Right, okay. So, but, but can I, can I just, yeah, can yeah, I just sure. add one more thing? Because the, the logical implication of the argument that you're making uh, around managing crisis is on the climate front, I think, solar geoengineering, because that's the one method mm. that capitalist states can um, uh, use potentially to quickly re-establish control and bend the curve or create breathing space to use the, the terms in circulation during the pandemic. And there's, there's no other method that so quickly potentially can uh, shave off some of the worst impacts of global warming as injecting soot, aerosols, into to the stratosphere and block some of the incoming sunlight. Uh, and the, this would be the equivalent of the vaccines. Mm -hmm. you, you mask mm -hmm. the crisis mm -hmm. for a time. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, there, there are, I mean, I'm afraid that we're sliding in that direction and that's where the underestimation of the enemy is happening. Mm. There was a report that came out from the National Academies of the Sciences in the U.S. that advocated for a mass research program uh, in the U.S. into solar geoengineering uh, along the lines of we have to keep all the options on the table. There is no report from that body on nationalization of the fossil fuel companies and closing them down. That option is never put on the table. Yeah, yeah. And precisely because it's not, you instead put yeah, yeah, things yeah. like solar geoengineering yeah. on the table. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that would be a new, I mean, a new way of, of throwing the planet down a path of disaster because no one knows exactly what unintended consequences could come from something like that. Yeah, yeah. it reminds me of um, um, a say of one of the teachers I had at university. Uh, the, the teacher taught us the Frankfurt School, mind you, and he taught us mm -hmm. for every problem there is the solution of bath and the solution of perfume. Yeah, 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 yeah so, exactly. So, so capitalism yeah. is uh, decisively yeah. on the side of the solution of uh, the pseudo-solution yeah. of, yeah. of, of perfume yeah, yeah, or fragrance. So let's come now to the bath, actually. Yeah, so yeah. so you, you are, your proposal is, is, is quite radical and, and formulated in a quite a provocative way, but it's more than just a provocation, obviously, uh, because you are yourself a committed anti-capitalist. Um, it's war communism. So... Um, Actually, what you are doing is, uh, in a way, you you want to be, in a way, as radical as I don't know, you know, neoliberals uh, have been in in the past, and see uh, the crisis as an opportunity for radical change. Actually, and I think this is the kind of thinking that uh, the left uh, crucially needs uh, today. And uh, your way of thinking, to sum it up briefly, is that you know. It's not that the catastrophe is coming, the catastrophe is here. Right? It's the impending catastrophe. And you remind us of the famous text by Lenin. Zizek has uh, elaborated on that some years ago, the impending uh, catastrophe and how to um, uh, confront it. And uh, you call for a kind of ecological Leninism, uh, which would be based on three principles. Huh? We should address the causes and not the symptoms. Uh, we should take immediate, swift and decisive action, okay? Not gradualism, not half measures, not, you know, it's not anymore the time for gradualism and, and, and reformism anymore. It's, we can't afford that actually anymore. I think that's, that's your point. And, and three, um, we shouldn't hesitate in using the state because we need some form of coercive authority here. 
And the third argument is more specifically directed against, let's say, libertarian or anarchists uh, on the left who, on the contrary, think that uh, the state is the problem. And in a way, we can say that this Foucauldian or neo-Foucauldian um, framework of biopolitics has contributed to that, right? Because it points to the fact that these authoritarian forms of social control are the, the, the problem um, in a way. Um, now, um, what's the agenda more specifically for war communism? Okay, we have to act decisively, swiftly, and, and so on, but uh, what, your, what would be your transitional program uh, for that? <laughs> uh, for, for Lenin in 1917, it was essentially peace and land, actually, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, and, sure. and of course, popular power yeah. in the concrete form it took yeah. Uh, at that moment, which yeah. were the Soviets, the councils, yeah. okay? Yeah. But essentially, in terms of social demands, let's yeah. say it was about yeah. peace, yeah. stopping the war immediately, yeah. and, and land. What is the equivalent of, of yeah. peace yeah. And, and land for us today? Yeah, yeah I don't think that there is uh, one demand only. Uh, obviously, as you said, I mean, peace, land, bread, uh, and perhaps in the end also Soviet power were the demands put forth by, by Bolsheviks. So there would need to be, if, if we're going to model ourselves on them <laughs> with all two differences, there would need to be a, a few different demands. But I think that one very central one will have to be ending fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And uh, this can be formulated as a very, very basic minimum demand as was done by the International Energy Agency the other week uh, when they published a report saying that we cannot have any more new oil or gas or coal facilities at all if we are going to have any chance to avert a warming by more than 1.5 degree. And that, I mean, that chance is vanishing. So it will be the same for two degrees mm -hmm. very soon. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's, it's a very simple and reasonable demand. No new oil and gas and coal facilities. No new pipelines, coal mines, platforms, liquefied natural gas terminals. Natural gas is not the correct term, but anyway, all of these things. N not, n nothing more of it. No, more, no further additions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a very simple demand. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's, in a sense, it's a transitional demand because it runs up against the fundamental logic of the companies that produce these things. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're saying to Total, you can't have any more new pipelines anywhere, then that means the end of that business. And that's why Total is building this insane pipeline in, the, in the, uh, East Africa. And it's going into the Arctic to get even more oil and gas. That's why Exxon is doing exactly the same thing. And that's why all oil and gas and coal companies are planning for expansion because that is how you accumulate capital. You expand all the time. So that, that extremely simple minimal demand, which doesn't even say ending all fossil fuels, but say an end to the expansion mm. is a demand that comes into collision mm. with mm. how these forces operate. Mm. Mm. And uh, uh, I think, I mean, that, that might not be what the, the masses are clamoring for, screaming for out there on the streets, stop those, those new installations. But it might be if the climate movement can articulate those demands in the moments when the climate crisis strikes, really. I mean, when there, when there are unbearable heat waves in France next time or any of the other climate disasters that we are bound to have. That is when you have to be the ecological Leninist mm, mm. and try to transform those crises of symptoms into crises for the drivers and mm. say, no, we mm. can't have this pipeline. The state has to mm. go in and stop Total from building it and all the rest. Of it. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the book, you call quite explicitly for the nationalization of those companies, yeah. actually. And, and, and even you go even further in, in, the, in the sense that you say it's not enough just to, in a way, expropriate them because you, your preference goes towards nationalization without compensation, actually, but uh, also to turn their infrastructure into uh, a public service rehabilitating uh, mm. The quality of air, actually, yeah. which uh, <laughs> I found a very uh, audacious, but um, also quite, you know, realistic uh, uh, type ty ty type of demand. Uh, this is very political, right? Yeah. And and of course, you need the control of the state to implement such a, such a point, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, 
now I, I, wa I want to, to explore a bit further, you know, some implications of this uh, strategy of, of war communism. You know, not, not to having the historical discussion, although it is interesting in itself, but you know, what, what, it, what it means now. Huh? The mm. subtitle of the, of the French edition of the book is uh, uh, Strategy for uh, the State of Chronic Emergency we are in, right? So try to think a bit uh, strategically. So. Um, the, the first question I wanted to ask you is, um, and, and this is something I have been thinking about reading, you know, more generally your, your text actually, is um, uh, you are very focused, of course, and quite rightly so, on, you know, these issues of um, ecological crisis, on fossil capitalism and, 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 and so on. Um, and, and you put emphasis on the fact that it is the mode of production that is at stake here. Nevertheless, do you consider that this angle is um, a self-sufficient one, that uh, the question of climate change or the ecological crisis is uh, a self-sufficient rationale for such a radical social change that uh, you, are, you are calling for. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do you think, I mean, what, what do you make of this very standard but nevertheless obvious question, how do we articulate this mm -hmm. with the rest of Sure. oppressions sure. Uh, sure. produced by this mode mm. of production. At some point in the book you say that capitalism obviously depends on primary resources and uh, um, materials uh, coming from um, uh, nature and, and so on, but it also crucially depends on the workforce, okay. obviously, okay. and it exploits uh, okay. uh, human labor. Uh, and, and, you know, a whole, an awful lot uh, comes out of this. Of uh, so what do you make of, 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 of the question of alliances? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And l let me be even more specific than this. Um, in the global north, at least, I think we can say rather safely that uh, the social composition of the movements, which have been rising uh, in mm -hmm. the last period uh, in favor of environmental change, have a very specific sociological profile. Mm -hmm. uh? mm -hmm. Essentially young people mm -hmm. coming from educated, educated middle and mm -hmm. upper middle classes. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we win the rest of society? Mm -hmm. and, and you know, th this is a very concrete issue. I mean, sure. we have, we have touched a bit, you know, about, you know, what meat consumption might mean, you know, in terms mm. of cultural codes which are encoded in, in a mm. class way, right? Mm. Uh, but uh, it's also very concrete. We have seen that in France uh, recently with the Gilets jaunes mm. crisis. Huh? Mm. It start, you know, the, this revolt started initially mm. as a revolt against a tax on gas, mm -hmm. right? So an ecological tax. Yep. So at first, uh, most of... Uh, French ecologists were quite hostile to this movement, mm -hmm. saying that, you know, these people, you know, they just want to use their, their, their car. Mm -hmm. And it appeared quite quickly, actually, mm -hmm. that things are not exactly this way mm -hmm. and that using the car for this population, the working class mm -hmm. living in deep suburbia mm -hmm. and in rural France, mm -hmm. is not an option. Of course. They, they have to of do course, so because course. urbanization mm -hmm. has taken a shape that mm -hmm. makes the use of the car mm -hmm. compulsory, yeah, yeah, actu yeah, yeah. actually. Yeah. So we should address, you know, the whole okay. problem. Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, there is the risk of building, uh, uh, you know, a, a powerful and, mm -hmm. and, and quite radical in its mm -hmm. own way social movement, but uh, that cannot build the kind of broader mm -hmm. block of forces mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can bring, I think, mm -hmm. a social mm -hmm. change. And, put capitalism sure, into sure, question sure. as such. I mean, how, how, yeah. how, do, how, do you think, how do you think this kind yeah, of big yeah. issue? Yeah, yeah so uh, a, a transition away from capitalism can certainly not only be animated by environmental concerns. Uh, and if that is our political goal, of course, it will have to engage with other kinds of social conflicts and contradictions as well. But I think also it's the other way around that a transition away from fossil fuels will not materialize if it cannot hook up with other kinds of discontent. Uh, and uh, I, I, I always these, these days in, in these contexts mention the incredible novel by Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, The Ministry for the Future which is a, you know, a science fiction scenario for how the next decades could play out in the kind of best case. Uh, 
And there, the, the, the transition is incredibly turbulent and messy and contradictory, but it, it contains everything from, from communes and square occupations in France to workers' uh, protests uh, in, in, in southern Africa uh, to property destruction from climate activists. And I think it's a realistic scenario in the sense that if we are going to have transition, a transition, it will have to... Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, be an articulation of very, very many different kinds of social struggles. That's obviously not the trajectory we're on right now, mm -hmm. but it's what we need. Uh, in, in more programmatic terms, the Green New Deal is, of course, an attempt to come up with uh, agendas for transforming advanced capitalist uh, countries in a way that benefits rather than harms the working class. And I'm in sympathy with that approach. That's one of the reasons why I tend to be more sympathetic to the Green New Deal than to the degrowth project, because mm, that mm, mm, has mm. much greater difficulties uh, aligning itself with the material interests of working people mm. and often comes across as, uh, uh, yeah, as, as upper middle class uh, uh, yeah. politics. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the Green New Deal hasn't succeeded yet. Uh, it lost because Corbyn, the Corbyn project lost in, in the UK and Sanders uh, lost in the US. But I, I still think that there is potential there. Uh, and there are a lot of different things that need to be uh, to be explored uh, 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 when it comes to making the the transition compatible with working class interests. And uh, of course, the longer the transition is delayed, the more dramatic it will have to be, which means that you might have very serious disruptions in people's lives once the transition gets underway. Uh, I mean, if you're going to close down certain fossil fuel companies, for instance, almost from one day to another, which is what you will have to do in the end, precisely because you waited so long, that means that there, lots of people could lose employment, uh, which is one reason I think that it's a good idea to think about what could those oil and gas companies be used for instead. Yeah. So you yeah. can keep all the people in employment, but just... Uh, change the yeah. way they use their yeah. skills and technologies a little bit yeah. so to, for instance, uh, capture CO2 instead and bury it under the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, I, I th when, when we're thinking about the, working, the role of the working class in the global north in the climate struggle, I, I think that because of the political state of this class in Europe, which is in quite a few countries a state of decomposition of the working class as a political force, not necessarily as a, as a class in itself, but as a, as a class for itself. As a class for itself, it's been in a decomposition for some time. That is obviously not exactly the case to the same extent everywhere. I mean, the, the, the level of class struggle you've had in France uh, over the past decade is, is, uh, is paradise compared to Sweden, for instance, where the working class is in a complete political coma. And to, uh, to count on this class being the propulsive force in the climate struggle when, uh, when this is the situation in the class, the most basic kind mm. of class struggle even, mm. is, is to me not entirely realistic. Mm. I think that it's more realistic to think that a climate movement looks rather like it did in 2019, but it, obviously it needs to come out of the white middle class ghetto. Mm -hmm. But uh, for people to build a climate movement, what you need is either you need knowledge about the crisis, mm -hmm. or you need experience of it mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. makes you alarmed, mm -hmm. or you need solidarity with the global mm -hmm. south. Mm -hmm. And these things do not necessarily appear at the point of production mm -hmm. so that you get the working class mm -hmm. to form the, the backbone mm -hmm. of an active, mm -hmm. aggressive, radical climate movement. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, what the climate movement needs to do, I think, is to make its demands compatible with a working class struggle for material interests, mm -hmm. so that there is a, a compatibility and correspondence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that we, uh, and here I'm, I'm perhaps in, a, uh, in disagreement with some of the, what I would say, the more workerist approaches to the climate struggle, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. there is still a lingering hope mm -hmm. that trade unions can suddenly morph into the vanguard of the climate struggle. I, mm. I, 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 w I wish that that could happen, but I don't really yeah. see it happening because of the state of trade unions in, in, in right. our country. Let, let me put it the, this way. Mm. Um, I mean, we all know that one of the strongest points that um, the feminist movements have made 
in, in the last few decades, I mean the radical ones, mm. uh, are that you know uh, these are, these questions of gender and gender oppression are not a kind of separate sector that should be added to the rest. Mm. They mm. permeate every question mm. somehow. Mm. So I would make, in a way, the same point about class here. Mm. I mean, for me, the point is not just making two heterogeneous things compatible, as mm. Mm. your formulation suggests. Mm. Uh, on the one hand, we have ecology. On the mm. other hand, we have you know, working class formulating mm. social demands. Mm. For me, there is a way to put class as something central in the way environmental questions mm. are, are, sure, are, sure. are formulated. Mm. L let me give a concrete example, once mm. again taken from the French example of the gilet jaune mm -hmm. and, and the whole thing. What is the mechanism actually behind the refusal of this supposedly ecological tax mm -hmm. on gas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's the fact that these people are forced to use their cars mm -hmm. and to even to have two cars mm -hmm. per household mm -hmm. because of the price of housing, mm -hmm. they have they have fled out of city centers and even the closed mm. suburbs to move further and further in deep suburbia and even mm. in you know what used to be countryside and now is becoming itself suburbanized mm. okay mm. in order to go to work because what's left of french mm. industry and a lot mm. and a lot of services mm. is extremely decentralized mm. and has moved out of city mm. centers mm. and so on so using the car is mm you know, a kind of, is, is compulsory because of this whole spatial arrangement. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a spatial fix, uh, mm -hmm. in, to put it in Harvey's term, mm -hmm. behind that. Now, what's the alternative to mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. I can see only one. Mm -hmm. You know, better public transportation, mm -hmm. A, yeah. and, you know, put a limit to urban sprawling. Mm -hmm. You know, wh one of the major limitations I find in the way mainstream ecological movements think about mobility, for instance, is, you know, they put emphasis on cycling, for instance. Mm. I have nothing against cycling mm. Uh, mm. In, in general, but, you know, cycling is only for mm. some people, mm. not for others, not for old people, not for people who have, you know, some kind of inability or uh, mm. uh, who do not <laughs> feel sufficiently mm. fit, you know, to mm. uh, cycle to their, to their workplace, for mm. instance, uh, on the one hand, and concretely, cycling in, in most European big cities mm. is actually for the affluent middle classes that still mm. live in, in city centers yeah, sure, sure. or near their workplace. Yeah, huh? yeah. For working class people, working class people almost by definition live mm. far from mm. their workplace, huh? hence the mm. use of car, etc. Mm. So you see, we need a whole rethinking of how uh, the spatial fix huh, yeah, and yeah, the urbanization yeah, yeah. is yeah, organized. Yeah, yeah. Think about public transportation and I think that ultimately these are class issues. Yeah, sure. I and and this is why, you know, ecological movements that are dominated by Afro and middle classes, mm. they just don't care about, mm. about, 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 about these issues. So, so for me, eco-socialism would be an attempt, you know, to think these two things together sure. ra rather than sure. in terms of compatibility. Sure, would you sure, agree sure. with that? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. It's just that uh, what, what I meant was that a social movement that pushes demands for climate mitigation, such as closing down fossil fuel companies, uh, will need to be based on uh, climate consciousness, if you like. Mm. And uh, I don't think that the level of class consciousness in the working class today is such that the leap from such class consciousness into climate consciousness is straightforward or is easy to make and that climate, when climate consciousness appears it can draw in people from many different backgrounds and classes and one of the problems of course of the movement in 2019 was that, that it had precisely the class bias that you that you described, mm -hmm. uh, but but you're 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 entirely right, and I I don't disagree with anything of what you said, and I I'm I'm also very happy to say that for a climate movement to get real social force and muscle and to be able to challenge its enemies, it desperately has to find a way to uh, combine itself with work and class consciousness because uh, it's incredibly hard to see affluent people being prepared to struggle to the extent that we need to struggle. And I think you saw that with, with the Fridays for Future movement in 2019 that was by far strongest in Germany mm -hmm. anywhere. And there was a point in, in, in the 
late 2019 when the concessions from Mer the Merkel government to the Fridays for Future movement were entirely unsatisfactory and where the leadership of the Fridays for Future movement, had it been more radical, should have taken the next step and launched mass civil disobedience and escalated the struggle when it had mm. you know, gathered millions of people on the streets. Mm. But it didn't do that because mm. it, it mm. was precisely that kind mm. of mm. timid middle class leadership mm. Uh, mm. That, that you described. Mm. I also think that when it comes to consumption, we really need to do exactly the opposite of what Macron did, and that is to target luxury emissions. So the kind of consumption that the richest do, yeah, yeah. which is the, the, the type of consumption that is, with, with no comparison, the most destructive to the climate and to other natural systems. Uh, and uh, by targeting that consumption, you can make swiftly and easily a, a difference to climate without hurting people's yeah. real needs, because yeah. it's not like people cannot yeah. survive without super yachts and private jets yeah. and all of these yeah. things. Yeah. 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 But you can also articulate a simmering class rage that need a target in that kind of environmental politics. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm essentially in agreement with what you're saying. Um, so the, the last, in a way, you know, strategic issue I want to discuss a bit with you, but it's a massive one actually, it has to yeah. do with the state and how we should use the state actually. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you make, you know, in that framework of uh, ecological Leninism or eco-Leninism, I, I, I like this, um, uh, the, the, this term actually, um, is that uh, we should not be ashamed to say that you know a level of coercion is needed that we cannot rely just on individual uh, initiative um, that um, uh, purely horizontal uh, modes of action have obvious limitations and that we have seen that most clearly in uh, the last crisis where it was absolutely necessary to impose you know by public institutions to the population a certain number of, of rules in order to confront a situation of emergency actually um, so uh, so far so good and we have also seen that you know some of the strongest points of the of your transitional program presuppose uh, the control of public institutions and of the, of the state. I mean, you cannot obviously nationalize uh, oil companies if you do not control no. uh, somehow the state. However, uh, you make this point and then you also say that um, the only state we have is uh, the capitalist state mm. and it has somehow be forced to act by a kind of external pressure coming from, obviously, social movements, uh, popular pressure. You also put electoral action and electoral campaigns as um, one of the modes uh, to build uh, this type of, of pressure. Uh, but then, you know, you say it would be um, criminal and uh, delusional uh, to uh, expect uh, a form of dual power and therefore, we have to work with this dreary bourgeois uh, state, which is uh, connected intimately uh, to uh, capitalist uh, companies and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that's one part of, of the question is, first of all, do you think that uh, the whole problem of seizing power mm. by some kind of political subject mm. is still necessary in order to move towards the war communism? Mm -hmm. Or do you see a kind of war communism uh, a bit like, you know, John Holloway said that, you know, we should um, uh, change the world but without yeah, taking yeah, power yeah. somehow just by exercising some mm. um, pressure from, from the outside. Mm. And, you know, I'm connecting this also with your book on, on how to sabotage the, mm. the pipeline. Uh, I totally agree with your criticism of, mm. you know, kind of absolute nonviolence, mm. etc. But sure. do you see, you know, just this repertoire of, of action as, as, a, as a solution, or do you think that uh, the ecological movement should build a proper political alternative yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and try to, to seize the state? And if it is to happen, then the lesson is that, you know, if you don't transform the state, the state will transform yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. And we have seen historically yeah, sure. some of the, um, <laughs> you know, the kind of results, uh, yeah. unfortunate results that yeah. the, this has yeah. produced. So what should we do? Yeah. <laughs> 
Let me just begin by admitting that this is the weakest, and uh, perhaps I should say indefensibly weak part of the book. Uh, and I, I have to confess that I spent maybe one week on sketching this argument uh, around war communism, and the result was very uh, crude and rough and incomplete and problematic because obviously the idea of having war communism without uh, some kind of a seizure of power. I mean, to have, to have war communism but no October is logically inconsistent. <clears throat> but let me, let me so, uh, so I accept all that kind of criticism towards uh, that part of the book, uh, just to try to explain how I think about these things. Mm. Uh, take the recent court case in the, the Netherlands, where a court in The Hague said that Shell has to reduce its emissions by 45% until 2030. Uh, this was a case that was filed by Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace in, uh, in the Netherlands. And because of the resources that you can uh, use in the legal branch of the state apparatus, they managed to convict the court to produce this verdict, which was hailed by the climate movement as a victory. Mm -hmm. And of course, Shell is freaking out about it and will appeal it. So we don't know if it's going to be implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, in a sense, it's, it tells you what is possible in that you can have pressure from climate mm -hmm. movements onto the existing bourgeois state apparatus, or at least branches of it. And if this pressure is sufficient, you can get the state to take certain decisions and potentially, at least, implement them. And this, by way of, of taking the discussion with the anarchists, is how I see any transition of this kind playing out. I mean, if, if you're going to address the problem of Shell, it has to be the state doing it. It can't be done by uh, f some local uh, affinity group or something like that. The role of the local affinity groups is to build the pressure on the state okay, to do what's sure. necessary. Yeah. But of course, we don't know <laughs> if, if that decision will be implemented. Uh, Shell might overturn it. Other parts of the bourgeois state apparatus might intervene and make sure that that doesn't happen because of course the, the, the Dutch state has served Shell very well and is probably keen to continue doing so because it's a capitalist state and that's how those states work. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, the flaw in my argument as presented in the book is I guess to uh, skip what will be a, a, a process of, if, if anything like this ever comes about, of climate movements and other uh, allied forces ramping up their pressure to the point where they can actually force the state to start doing things. But th then you have almost a dual power situation. Uh, because it's, it's quite unlikely that, that uh, we will, will be able to remote control the state while keeping it institutionally intact, as you say, and you know, make the state do our bidding. Uh, if we become strong enough, of course, there will be a backlash, there will be a reaction, mm -hmm. and uh, the situation might very well reach mm -hmm. a, a critical mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. where uh, you will also have some kind of institutional transformation of the state for it to mm -hmm. make the necessary decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, it's just that I guess that was my way of saying that I don't see a dual power situation emerging similar to the one in 1917 because the state of the class struggle is not such that we can expect the equivalent of the Soviets or the Reth in Germany to materialize in the near future. But if we're going to have a transition, there will need to be such social pressure and unrest that they might very well, and this is what I should have said, emerge some kind of formal equivalence to uh, these kind of dual power institutions. No one knows what they're going to look like. I don't think they will look like Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth. We're just mm -hmm. in the very early phases of this kind of development. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but yes, uh, a, a, a transition into something like war communism, which is of course used metaphorically as in uh, states uh, deposing mm. at least sections of the capitalist mm. class by coercive authorities mm. such as court verdicts backed up mm. by sanctions mm. and things mm. like that mm. uh, will probably require um, the building of, of alternative institutions as well that perhaps at some point uh, 
will mm -hmm. constitute themselves as mm -hmm. alternative or as mm -hmm. the new state. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe we should also wait to theorize this more before we see where things go and how things develop. And I would personally be very happy to, to jump into a total affirmation of anyth anything that, that appears to be uh, the seed of dual power. I mean, I wouldn't yeah, hesitate to do that. I, I wasn't thinking here so much about you know, dual power along the lines of October 1917, no. but about an articulation of a situation of dual power in the sense that you, know, you have a rising and, and, and uh, on the ascendance uh, social movement uh, yeah. uh, regrouping a, a whole range of, of social forces on the one hand, but also uh, changing uh, at least some of the institutions from the inside. Yeah, uh? So yeah, a kind yeah, of, you yeah. know, uh, uh, Nikos Poulans has called that a democratic road to socialism. Yeah, 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 he yeah, was yeah, inspired yeah. by Chile, yeah. for instance, yeah. but you know, uh, we, we can think of Allende and, and yeah. Chile, but an Allende that would not hesitate using coercive forces yeah, yeah, against yeah, adversaries, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah. instead of, on the contrary, you know, uh, sure. uh, making concessions and yeah. finally being crushed mm. by uh, uh, reaction and, and, mm. and counter-revolution. But I was thinking, you know, about a flexible mm. uh, strategy combining mm. pressure from the outside, yeah, yeah, yeah. building autonomous uh, social movements on the one hand, but yeah. also trying to control uh, pieces of the institutional absolutely, apparatus absolutely, which you can yeah, control, yeah, right? for instance, via elections. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's, easy, it's very easy, of course, for us to despair about more or less everything, but you, it's also easy to lapse into hope. And one of the moments in recent years when I really lapsed into hope was when uh, the Labour Party uh, in the UK uh, in the election in 2019 presented its programme uh, for how to transform Britain and put climate up in front and said all the right things, made all the right demands that really articulated working class demands with the what needs to be done to, to deal with, with the climate crisis. And uh, uh, that was the best programme I've seen any major party in an advanced capitalist country put forth uh, precisely by, by combining class and climate in that extremely uh, far-sighted way that Labour did. And then they lost, of course, because nationalism always screws everything up in the end. Uh, uh, and uh, that was uh, another moment of despair, but I think that we should remember that Corbyn wasn't that far from winning. And had he won, we would have been perhaps in a quite different political landscape in the UK, at least. It could have been a very interesting articulation between uh, Corbyn as a prime minister uh, and uh, a Labour Party led by him and climate movements from the outside, Extinction Rebellion and, uh, and uh, other parts of the climate movement. And perhaps somewhere there can be an electoral breakthrough of that kind. And I'm all in favour of trying again. Uh, and uh, yes, we, which means that you have to start from somewhere, and yeah. as your example suggests, this somewhere is inevitably, at least as a starting point, at a national level. Although the problem in itself is not national by yeah. definition, you know, ecological yeah. problems yeah. ignore uh, yeah. national yeah. boundaries and, and 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 frontiers. But nevertheless, we should start from somewhere. I'm mentioning this because in the book you say that you know. Uh, uh, we, we cannot dream of um, uh, a kind of uh, uh, war communism or this kind of program in, in just in one country. Mm -hmm. uh, you suggest that there will be a kind of scramble, uh, this is the metaphor you use, uh, of several countries almost uh, synchronous uh, uh, in in this uh, entering this uh, this the, the, this process, Th I think in reality things mm. are never mm. quite mm. synchronous. Although no, there are sure, waves, sure, of sure. course. I mean, you, we should here address I think yeah. the fact that you know we should start from somewhere absolutely, absolutely. Wh when you know the balance of forces mm. is favourable for sure, us. And sure. by definition, as your example suggests, this mm. is on the national level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Example. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah. I think we can finish with that message of hope uh, <laughs> for uh, the perspective of social change and yeah. thanks thanks a lot thanks Andreas. so much uh, Stantis. thanks yeah. so much really appreciate it yeah.